Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Solid Rock Bible Church this morning here in Kansas City. In this wonderful uh, July morning. Oh, wait a minute. It just feels like July, I guess. Uh, we're, didn't we have a frost warning a couple weeks ago? I don't know. I, I'm confused. But anyway, good morning. It's great to see you all here this morning. Uh, and we are going to start the morning off with a word of prayer. So join me in prayer, will you? Lord God, thank you so much again for this opportunity. We cherish this time together here as a church family. We want to set this time aside. We want to focus uh, on you and what you have done for us, Lord. And we want to express our gratitude in song and in prayer to you this morning, Lord. Uh, we know you're blessed all our time together. We just uh, want to take this time to celebrate you this morning. We ask uh, that you would bless our pastor as he comes forward with the message that he has prepared and he, you have put on his heart, and we look forward to that message this morning. So again, we want to give you all the glory. It's in the precious heavenly name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right, grab your bulletins. There are a few things we need to look at here uh, this morning. Bible study this evening as we continue in the name, the Names of God there series, and uh, that will be 6 p.m. here at the church. Wednesdays, 8 a.m. is a, a, a men's breakfast time. Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. is our prayer meeting Bible study youth group. Uh, this Friday will be our secret church video. Uh, and the note there is today is the final day to sign up so that we have an accurate number of folks that will be attending that. That is this Friday, 6 p.m. to midnight. Uh, have any questions, see Fred there, and he'll be happy to answer those questions for you. There is a sign-up sheet in the welco at the welcome desk. Uh, next Sunday, we will have a VBS meeting following worship service downstairs. And, of course, uh, there are future meetings scheduled there in the future events category there in your bulletin. Uh, so mark your calendars for those meetings. And, of course, July 8th through the 12th will be our Vacation Bible School here at the church, The Great Jungle Journey. And so be praying about that. And there is still time and room for you to volunteer in that uh, wonderful event that we have coming up in July, July 8th through the 12th. Okay, uh, May 30th uh, is our church family trip to Branson, and I would assume we have those plans already in place there, uh, and we look forward to that time together too. Uh, June 23rd through the 27th will be our uh, time that we can go to Bethany, Missouri, and volunteer in what is called Camp Hope, and that's just a wonderful opportunity to minister, minister to kids uh, up north that have challenges uh, with uh, parents incarcerated and other things that they have going on in their lives. And it's just a great opportunity to serve there. If you have questions about Camp Hope, please see Pastor Shane or Pastor Jerry as soon as possible as we would like to get plans in place for that. Okay. Uh, also listed there is Vacation Bible School Craft Needs. Uh, those items listed there. And uh, we will probably have more of those to follow. All right. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our worship team here this morning. As we worship God, we often want to focus on one or two attributes of his. And this morning, we're thinking about the faithfulness of God. We're thinking about the fact that he is dependable and that no matter what situations we face, God remains the same. And he is always faithful to himself. He's always faithful to his promises to us. And so we can depend on that. That's why it's a firm foundation to build our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's never let us down, and he never will. He's been our God in the ages past, in the present age, and the age to come. He was God, a faithful one, through all the world wars that we have faced. 
And many stories emerge from those of times when God, in his faithfulness, protected his people. And we can depend upon him in a world of uncertainty today. We have a God who doesn't change. We're going to stand and worship God. Oh, God, our help. Ages past. Oh,
faithful in the past throughout the generations and you've called us to remember your faithfulness and to trust you for today we choose O oh God to put our full confidence in you to not trust ourselves but to trust you we thank you that you will always be what you have always been and so, Lord, we give back to you a part of what you've given to us, asking you, God, to use this to take the gospel around the world and to encourage people who are here as well. And we pray, God, that you'll bless the gift and you'll bless the giver. And again, we want to thank you. You're a God who has never changed and never will. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to ask Patrick to lead us in this next song, and I know that a lot of you know it, so we will ask you to join as soon as you recognize your place to come in. Welcome, Patrick. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. Never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So I would he fail now. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't.
gonna make it through Because I'm standing strong on you Cause I'm gonna make it through Cause my house is built on you Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking Let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't Well, we come to that time in our service when we focus our minds on hearing from heaven. Mm. And so let's bow our heads and ask God by his Holy Spirit to speak to us now. Oh God, we are so thankful for your word. And you have promised that your Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. We're grateful that you enlighten our hearts and as we read and study your word, we learn about you. And we find your love, your grace, your plan of redemption. And God, we are so thankful that we can trust your unchanging, infallible, inspired word. Yes, Lord. And as we open it today, I pray that you use Brother Shane to speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, good morning. You guys look great, looking wonderful. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. And I, uh, I just want to say up front, uh, I want to thank you, Patrick, for what God laid on your heart with that song, because that firm foundation is the very thing we're going to talk about today. We are starting a new journey we're going to be in the book of Joshua, and we're going to be there for a little bit. And, it, and like I said, if you're following along in the reading, uh, you should be in Joshua 5 or 6 by now, and uh, you should be reading in the Psalms as well. And uh, so it's really neat, I think, that as we traverse through the Bible, as you're reading and we're hearing the application of it also when we come on Sunday, um, that can be very helpful in, in getting a better uh, grip on God's Word. And so we're going to be in Joshua for, I'm going to say, eight to ten weeks because you, know, uh, you know what God's dealing with here. And so um, <laughs> it's one of those things where I just need Him to guide me and I don't really know what the end result's going to be. I'm just going to trust Him. So I'm going to say eight to ten, maybe twenty um, sermons or so, and we'll be out of Joshua. You guys should be in Matthew by then, and uh, we'll just keep rolling. But for now, we're going to get into Joshua chapter one, and if you could, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in verse one. And it says, Now it came about after the death of Moses that the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. 
from the wilderness and his and from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is is with you wherever you go. What a wonderful blessing to have God's word. You may be seated. Today, we are starting this new journey, and um, as we do so, we are going to see some various big events that take place in the book of Joshua. And we're going to see it culminated with the importance of how to serve as a leader of your family, and to those around you. And I think in the journey as we go, you'll pick up some other things, and I'm hoping you'll pick up some stuff today, because even though this is an Old Testament story, we live for and are indwelled by the same Holy Spirit of God in which these people were led in this time that we're looking at today. So you have that same power you have that same opportunity, and you have the same opportunity for purpose that God has for you. And today, we're going to look about at how to live a successful Christian life. Now, I think in the world that we live in, it views success in a number of ways. And a lot of times, success comes by looking at someone who has a lot of material blessings, uh, they have done well in some aspect of their life, and you look at them, and they're driving the newest car, they live in the biggest house, they eat at the fanciest restaurants, and you'll, you'll say, that person must be successful. But when you look at the Bible, the Bible has a very different view about what success, success really is. So this may take the pressure off your shoulders today if you give this message a little time to sink in. The success is not what the world says it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little excerpt from uh, a book that I've read. It's called Little House on the Freeway, and it's by Eugene Peterson. And here is the thing. I want to put a biblical perspective on success among the apostles, the one absolutely stunning success was Judas. And the only one thoroughly a failure was Peter. Now bear with me and listen, okay? Judas was a success in the ways that most impress us. He was successful both financially and politically. He cleverly arranged to control the money of the apostles' band, he skillfully manipulated the political forces of the day to accomplish his goal. And Peter was a failure in ways that most would dread. He was in a crisis and a very socially inept person. At the arrest of Jesus, Peter collapsed. He was a hapless, blustering coward. In the most critical situation of his life with Jesus... The confession on the road to Caesarea and Philippi and the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said some of the most embarrassingly inappropriate things. 
He was not the companion we would have want, wanted with us in the time of danger. And he was not the kind of person we would feel comfortable with at a social occasion. Time, of course, has reversed our judgments of the two men. Judas is now a byword for betrayal. And Peter is one of the most honored names in the church and in the world. Judas is a villain and Peter is a saint. Yet the world continues to chase after the successes of Judas, financial wealth and political power, and to defend itself against the failures of Peter. I took that excerpt because I thought it was really important for us to understand what the Bible really views as someone's life has lived out a value of success. And I think that's a really good example. True success, folks, is not what the world thinks of you. True success is what God thinks of you. That's true success. The book of Joshua is something that is a new beginning for the Israelites. We've covered the first five books by now in your reading log. We've been through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And you're going to see this time in the desert being closed out. And there's going to be this new beginning with this new leader, and his name is Joshua, because Moses is going to be with the Lord. So we find that there's some very big shoes for Joseph to fill. Very big shoes. I remember early on in ministry, when God had called me into ministry, I had a wonderful pastor like the, many of these wonderful pastors here in this church that we are so blessed to have. And Pastor Fred was a great man of humility. And I got to tell you what, not only was he a big man with big shoes on his feet, he was a big man spiritually with big shoes to fill if I was going to come behind him and be the man God was calling me to be. Big shoes. But the one thing that I learned very early on that God never asked me to wear his shoes. He never asked me to wear Brother Fred's shoes. Didn't matter that his shoe size was probably a 14 or a 15. Like I said, he was a big man. And my little ten and a half feet would not fit that. I'd look like a clown running through the yard and tripping over myself. But see, that's the thing. God wants us to be a success at His hands and fill nobody else's shoes but the shoes that He gave us to walk in for His name and for His glory. And we're going to see that Joshua is being prepared because Joshua is called. God prepares those whom he calls. He's got you prepared. Every single one of us that can hear my voice, God has something for you in this life, something for you to partake of and to do and not to shrink back from because you've seen somebody else do it a whole lot better than what you think you can do. Do you not think that God knows that? Do you not think that God knows your steps and your future? And if He's calling you to do it, you just stand up and do it because it's not about whether or not you're trying to fill somebody else's shoes, but whether or not you're going to walk in the ones that God is calling you to walk in. I feel like so many churches across this nation languish with people who are not in ministry because they have shrank back because they've seen somebody that they thought were so much more articulate than them, so much more smarter than them, and such a much harder studier than them. If God called you to do something, buckle up and dive in. That's what where we are with Joshua. And I don't know if you missed it, and maybe I didn't spend enough time with it, but you know, we've seen Joshua in the background as we were going through the book of Exodus. He was there. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about him, and it wasn't by 
designed to do that. It's just, here we are today, we're in the book of Joshua, and here's this kid that must have been born in that captivity of slavery there in Egypt. You remember in Exodus when we were talking about the plagues that came upon the people and such, and guess what? Um, The son of Nun, Joshua, had a family that were God-believing people who put the blood of the lamb upon the lentils because Joshua was the firstborn child and if that had not been the case, he would be dead. We wouldn't be talking about Joshua if he didn't have a believing, raising up family. And so we find that some time has passed and we're talking about Joshua. Let me just read to you again. Now it came about after the death of Moses, this is in verse 1, the servant of the Lord that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' his servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. This is God's calling on his life. So now arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them to the sons of Israel. Man, we find this young man who has been at the side of Moses for a little bit of time now, but a lot of times we kind of, we we run past that. We're looking at the bigger things that are happening in the book of Exodus and so on, but we run past the fact that Joshua is a called man and he's being raised up. And folks, I just got to remind you, you never know who's around you who you could be raising up for God's next calling. You never know who it is that you could be pouring into that is going to be the next Joshua or leader for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You just don't know. So I would say just do it. Look around and find someone to engage with and and love on them and teach them what you know in the Word and help them grow because God's got big things for you and for them to do. How do I know that? You're in Exodus 7, 8 when we see that Moses is going to handpick our good friend Joseph to be a part of this conquering of the Amalekites. We find there in verse 8, it says, Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out. Now, do you remember me talking about any of this in chapter 17 of Exodus? You don't because I didn't. (laughs) I didn't, and it wasn't, again, by design, but God is so good. That's why we're here now where we are. And it says that, so Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on the top of the hill. You know the story. Arms would come down. They'd lift up the arms of Moses. They'd win the battle. They went back and forth for a minute. Okay, I'm just getting to the point. So here's the deal, though. Joshua is again seen in chapter 24 of Exodus, verses 12 and 13. And no, I didn't talk about him there either. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me and on the mountain and stay there and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instructions. Now you're catching that God is talking to Moses, but just in the background there is Joshua. So Moses got up along with Joshua, his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Joseph's in the picture. Joseph is walking with a leader, Moses. And all of that is just rubbing itself onto Joshua in the daily life of their doings. Being a servant of a man, with a man of God, you find. But see, we haven't taken a journey through the book of Numbers either. But you should have read through that. And when you read through the book of Numbers, in chapter 13 and 14, you would have found Joshua and Caleb and ten other guys that have been sent into the land to spy some things out, that land across the Jordan. And what happens is these guys come back with a report. 
And the report was, oh yes, the land is a land of milk and honey. It's great, but there's giants over there. We, we shouldn't go. Ten of these guys, so we shouldn't go. But, but Caleb and Joseph, Joseph, <laughs> Caleb and Joshua basically said, no, we can go. We got, we can do this. Here, we're going to see that God was going to go with them and God was going to do exactly what was needed. And see, you find in verse 31 of Deuteronomy another spot where we hear about Joshua. It's at the end of the life of Moses. And I've always been taught and it's always been an understanding for me that for every pastor or teacher of the Word of God should always be training their replacement. I'm not going to be here forever. Neither are you, but I may check out before you. I don't have a real good genetic background. My biological father was dead by the time he was 50. 50! You know? You never know what God has for you, but you got to live each and every day without the worry of tomorrow. You just, you just keep going because you know who you're safe in, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you should be training your replacement. You should be training up kids to carry on your family traditions of seeking the Lord and living for the Lord and, 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 and being this encourager to other people and, and, and living out charity for people of this world. Because families are quickly losing that in the nation in which we live in. This world is changing very quickly. And serving God is not first on the agenda. But with Joshua, if you remember in 24, 14 or 15, he says, for me and my house will serve the Lord. I just can't remember the exact one. I think it's 15, 24, 15. We have to get ourselves back to that if we're not already there in this world that is what needs to reign supreme is that christ is king of kings and lord of lord in our lives and the lives of our family and as we traverse through this generation of people that we're living in and we tell them about the gospel what we will find is god moving even though it's very scary to do that so i want to just encourage you to listen for just a second with Deuteronomy 31, verse 1 through 8. So Moses went and spoke to the, the words to all of Israel and said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. And the Lord has told me, you shall not cross the Jordan. It is the Lord your God who is going to cross ahead of you. He himself will destroy the nations before you and shall dispossess them. Joshua is the one who is going to cross ahead of you, just as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them just as he did in Shion, Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites and to their land when he had destroyed them. The Lord will turn them over to you and will do to them in accordance with all the commandments which I have commanded you. You hear this a lot. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or in dread of them. For God is the one who was going with you. He will not desert you or abandon you. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous. For you will go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you will give it to them as an inheritance. And the Lord is the one who is going ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not desert you or abandon you. Do not fear or be dismayed. It's not very much longer that in Joshua chapter 1, Verse 9, that, God, that we're hearing the same thing. Be courageous, be strong. God 
goes with you. And Joshua knew he needed that. He was fulfilling some shoes. And I think a lot of people get scared when something's in front of them. Anxiety begins to pick up and they feel like there's stuff that they can't do. Well, that's okay. Because I want to remind you that in your weakness, that's when God is strong. I want to remind you that He's the one that goes before you and He takes care of things. So so don't shrink back. I love what... Chuck Swindoll says, he says, I don't know God's plan for your life, and neither do you. But for all you know, He is training you and shaping you this very moment to step in and serve as a pastor, as a board member, or part of the student body leader to fill the shoes of someone that has done a bang-up job. Sure, You're different from that person, but if God is calling you into that place of appointment, He can use you in a remarkable way. Charles Swindoll on Moses, man of selfless dedication. Every single one of you that hear my voice, whether today or down the road when you listen to this message, because We're grateful for uh, technology and video recordings and the web and all that. Understand this. I know what Chuck just said there might be somewhat of a level of anxiety for you. But God goes with you and he can use you. Yes, you in a remarkable way. You just got to say, here I am, Lord. That's all you got to say. Here I am. He doesn't need you to bring anything to the table but yourself. As they've said many a times, God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Believe that. I stand before you. Believe that. You know why? God makes us a lot of promises. God promises that he'll be with us no matter what. In verses 3 through 6, it says, Every place on which the sole of your footsteps, I have given it to you. That's a promise. Just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, And as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No one will be able to oppose you all the days of your life. This is a wonderful statement to Joshua right here. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not desert you nor abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. So here it is. We can go into chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. We can find out in 34 verse 7, although Moses was 120 years old, when he died, his eyes was not dim, nor was his vigor abated. It's not like Moses was some old, uh, decrepit man. It was time for him to go home and be with the Lord. His eyes were not dim. His body was probably in shape to still move around and go with the people. But God was removing him from the situation, and there was a man prepared to step in the place. Now, I can imagine what that felt like after this took place because I've literally been in this situation where my pastor passed away on a Sunday and by the next Sunday I was in the pulpit preaching. I know what that's like and to know what the people might possibly say about the man who's going to fill the pulpit the next Sunday. Is he able to do it? Um, Will he be able to get through it? What, What is he going to do? What is it going to be like? And This guy was asking some of the same questions. I think Joshua knew what was in front of him. Let me tell you what, he had 30 days to think about it because in verse 8 it says, So the sons of Israel wept for Moses for how long? 
30 days. There was a point where they were going to be done weeping and then they were going to turn and they were going to look for leadership. Joshua was that guy. And I'm sure that he was a bit nervous. I imagine his mind was flooding with anxiety. Patrick, I'm not trying to pick on you. I appreciate you singing today, brother. But when you stand up and you sing in front of a bunch of people you've never sang in front of before, you may have sang that song a thousand times, but there's this nervousness and anxiety that I think still raises up. Now, maybe you got it all together, but this guy, I would have been nervous. I'd have been nervous. Because every Sunday I get up to preach, there is a level of nervousness there. I want to let you know that. I don't have it all together, folks. I'm in that front row praying and I, that I'm asking God, Lord, please do not let me get up there and fall on my face and mess up your word. Not about me, not about what I look like, but, but let me not misuse your word as it's preached. I'm a fallible man and I know that. But I get up to be used because God has called me to do that. And God has called you to stand up and be used. We all have insecurities. We all know that even though we have insecurities, there are responsibilities in our life, especially our spiritual walk. And I want you to rest assured that God has your next steps. You can read how God has reassured our good friend, Joshua. You go back to verse 5 where it says, Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Every believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Of God. Every born again believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And God has you, He's with you. But I think we live a very meager spiritual life, and I think we miss out on some of the blessings we could see come to fruition because. We're not trusting God and, and stepping out on faith and trusting that He is there for every step. I think we shrink back. And I just want to tell you, every single one of us are facing an obstacle in our life at some point. You've got to understand that the God of Joshua is your God. And the power that was available to him is available to you to live each and every day and traverse through every single obstacle in your way. And so as we read through this scripture, we find that God presents us with some secrets of success. It's our final point. It says in verse 7, it says, Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep, keep your eyes focused. You see what's being said here? Look straight ahead. Don't be distracted over here. You know, we, we joke about squirrel, squirrel. Well, that, that's my life. But my desire is to keep my eyes focused on the Lord. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, so that you may achieve success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. These are some keys we're going to talk about real briefly. The law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will achieve Success. This was a really easy outline this week, Pastor. I'm just going to let you know. I hope the others come like that as well. It's all right there. It always is. 
I have not commanded you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many times has that been said in chapter 34, in chapter of Deuteronomy, in chapter 1 of Joshua? Multiple times. It should be important for us to see that this soldier, this leader, Joshua, was going to be able to move forward and know that God was with him. He was a brilliant leader. He truly was. I think Joshua was probably a very reserved person. He probably wasn't like me. Um, he was pretty reserved. And he had this very wonderful career that was straightforward. And the one thing that he did was he put one foot in front of the other. There's a song about that. Put one foot in front of the other. It's like a Sesame Street song or something. You all have probably seen it somewhere, you know. But it's important for us to see that the, the game plan for Joshua was not all these schematics of, of, of warfare and everything like that. It was put one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. That's what it's supposed to be like. And if you're going to back up, just put that foot behind the other. And keep moving. And don't be looking to the right or the left. It's kind of like when you do the balance beam. I remember watching my daughter do the balance beam when she was taking the academy test. She went across the balance beam. She did pretty good. The reason she did pretty good because the balance beam was like 10 feet long. You know what a balance beam is, right? It's like 10 foot long, but she hit it at a running stride. She only had to hit, hit it like twice with her feet. And then she could fall off to the side and they would accept that. But if you were walking across that balance beam... Are you looking over here? Hey, I'm doing it, Dad. No, she'd fall off the balance beam. Don't be looking to the right. Don't be looking to the left. Look straight ahead and what God has for you. And you will be doing exactly what God wants for you. And it won't be about prosperity. I mean, there's prosperity that's talked about in here. And I, uh, some of these prosperity teachers and preachers, I'll tell you what. You got to understand that success is not what the world views you by, that you're not a, you're this you're not this really super Christian because you live in a 5 million dollar home and drive million dollar cars. That's that's the world's idea of success. The success that you will find is what Joshua did. One step in front of the other, what God wants me to do, I will do, and I won't stop until he tells me to. That's what he did. Well, what did God tell him to do for success? Well, it's right here in Scripture. The formula is right before you. As you look, you can look at this uh, uh, verse again. And it says, Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful. Do according all that the law was given to Moses. My servant commanded you. Do not turn from the left or the right so that you may have success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's the first thing that Joshua was told. But not before he was told to know the Word of God. It's important for us to know the Word of God. We should read the Word. I think that's why the Lord's laid on my heart this year for us to, to go along with the reading as best we can as He directs and see what God is doing there. Getting to know the Word of God. But secondly, he told Joshua that he needed to not let the Word depart from his mouth. That didn't mean to go, you get that right? Mm -hmm. Don't let the Word. He was saying the Word needs to be in your mouth and being shared with others at every opportunity. Don't let it depart. Let those words be upon your lips. Let the Word of God and the study of it be the thing that you are doing. Let the Word of God be the thing on your mouth and not some of the other things we hear when we're cut off by somebody in traffic. And the third thing was, he was told, but you shall meditate on the Word of God. 
When you meditate on the Word of God, it's where you begin to see how that applies to your life and mine. When we meditate on the Word of God, that's what we're doing. We're seeing how it's applicable to our life. And when you're reading that Word, you want to stop and say, okay, God, what what are you saying about the context of this? And now, God, Now that I've got the context right, what are you saying to me for the application? You know, I'll tell you something. Um, I love it the day when the application of God's Word hit me about the night when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples. I love it when that Word hit me for application. When you hear that, it, it, you may have pastors that are very encouraging. They lift you up and all this stuff. Yes, go wash people's feet. Be a servant and do all these things. But the one thing that hit me with the application of that was that Jesus had 12 people there whose feet he was going to wash. And one of them was Judas. It was Judas. The one who would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Not very much longer after the feet were washed and dried. Whoa! That application to me when I meditated upon that was like, whoa, everything's coming together. Love my enemies, washing their feet. Love my spouse when we don't get along all the time together. Wash the feet. Love my boss when he gives me the stinkiest, baddest job in the whole place. Wash the feet. Ha! Ah, application. Meditation upon the Word. And then, then the fourth thing that we look at is Joshua was to obey the Word in its entirety. Because it said in verse 7, Be careful to obey. All the law of my servant Moses that gave you. Do not turn from the right or the left. Observe it as it is written. That's important. I'll leave you with one final thing. The importance, I believe, of all this. I've been taking American history at the seminary. And you go, oh, they do regular courses there? Yes, they do. It's a whole lot better. I asked Pastor Jerry when we were doing this. I said, do you think I should maybe just go over here to the, the, the uh, oh, what is that, Maple Woods? Uh, the, the, the classes are a whole lot cheaper over there and so on and this and that. And Pastor Jerry goes, no, I think you should go um, to Mid- Midwestern, even if you're going to take your gen ed stuff, because God will still be in the midst of that teaching and that information in a godly lens. And he's absolutely right. 100% right. I'm in American history part two, and you know, we're dealing with some of the presidents. Uh, we, we've just done with, uh, dealt with the assassination of, of Kennedy, and, and we got uh, a whole lot of stuff going on, you know, how Kennedy beat, beat Nixon, and, and, and we're, we're just dealing with that. But we've dealt with a lot of presidents, and one of the presidents that we dealt with not too far off a long ago was James Garfield. And I don't know, as a lot of people would know uh, or not, he was actually a, a, a principal at, at a school. I think it was called Hiram College. And while he was a principal there, he had one of the students' fathers come up to him and say, um, Mr. Garfield, I wonder if you couldn't kind of simplify the studies for my son, make him a little shorter so he can have a shorter route through his college years. And uh, Garfield thought about it for a second, and this was his reply. He goes, well, I got to ask you, he goes, I can do it, but I got to ask you, because it all depends on what you want to make of your boy. He goes, when God wants to make an oak tree, he takes over a hundred years to make it tall and solid. He says, but when he wants to make a squash, it only requires two months. Do you want your boy to be an oak tree or a squash? 
And I think it's an important illustration for us that we have a lot of squashes when it comes to people living out their faith in Christ Jesus. We do. Because you know in this nation we have over 200 million Christians, but we don't have a lot of Joshua's. We lack Joshua's. People who will put their foot, one foot in front of the other, for the Lord and His direction. Folks, for the ministry of God, we don't need clever methods. We don't need clever people. We don't need anything other than obedience to God and abiding in the Word of God to move the gospel of Christ across this nation and this world. And every single one of you have purpose and can be a catalyst for that very thing happening. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for a wonderful message at the very start of Joshua the information that we see in this beginning journey is Joshua is going to take leadership. We see some very pivotal things that are so important for each and every one of us to know that we need to be courageous. We we need to be people who aren't fearful, but that are trusting in the one true God for the next steps of every day of our lives. Lord, we want to draw in and we want to do better. And we know that your grace and your mercy is sufficient and that you will receive that um, want and you will embrace it for us and that you will help us grow with the sanctification that is needed and you will guide us into the places and and for the purposes that you've designed us for. But all we've got to do is put one foot in front of the other and keep our eyes on you. Lord, help us to resonate that in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you all would stand, this is a time of invitation. We'd love for you to utilize the stage to pray. Pray from where you're at, or I'll be happy to pray with you. John will.
microphone on, don't I? So I said, stepping back up here, I was just giving you confidence that I would not, you know, you could be courageous knowing that I'm not going to preach again. So um, there's a couple things that we want to um, observe that we think are so very important here. One is, I always love to introduce uh, new members to our church, and um, we, we've got Ross Shank back here, If uh, he's got his hand up there, uh, he is uh, a, a new member of our church, and we're going to move forward with our new membership class and so on and so forth, so let's give him a big warm welcome to the family. And then uh, we're very excited, I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Jerry, but we we had a wonderful baptism on Easter, and, and we want to acknowledge that. I'm going to ask Abdul if you would please come forward. Abdul comes out of an Islamic background and came to know that Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is his Savior. And uh, we baptized him on Easter Sunday morning. And we're so glad for that. Now, Abdul, I'm going to have you say your full name. Abdul Jabbar Sam Abdul Jabbar Melita. All right, there'll be a quiz on that for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so when you see him, uh, just call him Abdul. <laughs> and uh, it is my pleasure to present to you this certificate of baptism with your name on it, having given profession of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and his personal Savior, he was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit on March the 31st, 2024, here at Solid Rock Bible Church. And it was my privilege to do that, and I present to you the certificate of baptism. Congratulations, brother. Congratulations. So today we are recognizing a, a member of Solid Rock Bible Church and also we're recognizing a member of the body of Christ. Amen. And we are so thankful for that. Yes. Amen. God is good. Um, so we're going to get ready to, to close out here. And I, I was looking at his name on there. I did come up with something, though. We can make it shorter. He's got Abdul Jabbar twice in there. I just We call you AJ. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> make it simple but it's Abdul it's Abdul and I just you know I like acronyms and things you know so there you got it um, we're going to get ready to to close and um, at this time uh, Cody would you close us in prayer